All right, open your Bibles with me tonight to Acts chapter 11 as we continue our study through Acts. Tonight we conclude the 11th chapter of Acts. Acts chapter 11, we're looking at verses 27 through 30. So a very short um, spot in Scripture here, Acts 11, verses 27 through 30. And tonight's sermon is entitled, Stewardship of the Church's Gift. When I was in high school, I worked in a bowling alley, no, in a subway, in a bowling alley, on a Navy base in Meridian. It's really difficult to keep up with all of that because when you start off in Subway, you really could go anywhere because it's one of those restaurants that you run into in the airport, you run into in the gas station, you run into basically wherever you would go, but you wouldn't expect it to be in a bowling alley, and then you wouldn't expect that bowling alley to be on a Navy base, and you wouldn't expect that Navy base to be in Meridian because I lived in Meridian for a very long time and had no idea there was a Navy base there. And so here I am in the Subway, in the bowling alley, on the Navy base in Meridian, and me, 16 years old, I had no understanding of anything military related. But one thing I found out very fast, and I think you'll like this, Ricky, is um, I, I found out about government spending. Because just as soon as we got in there, the bowling alley got a renovation. And y'all, I was 16 years old. I came to Hattiesburg when I was 18. And I'm telling you, that, re- that bowling alley was renovated two times in the time that I was working in the bowling alley in Subway on the Navy base in Meridian. And I learned that there's big wigs up in Washington and maybe in our state capital as well who ask for the money, but they don't really understand what the money is going to be used for. And that money is then granted by the big wigs, and it's given to these people who they don't understand what the money is going to be used for either. And they just budget it out to all these different places. And then the bowling alley and entertainment on the Navy base that all there is to do is go bowling on the Navy base has this huge budget where they have to redo the bowling alley every couple of years. And it just doesn't seem like the most fiscally responsible thing to do. But this is what they're doing because this is how government spending works. They've been allotted this amount of money and they just tear it down, build it back, tear it down, build it back, tear it down, build it back over and over and over again. And I don't think it takes a rocket scientist or a genius or a big wig or a government agency to understand that's probably not the wisest usage of tax dollars. It's probably not the wisest usage of defense spending. It's probably not the wisest usage of money. And in God's word, tonight we're going to find in this very small portion of the 11th chapter of Acts, what the responsibility of each individual in the church is in regards to the stewardship of God's money. Many times we look through scripture and we think that all scripture has to say is that when the plates come around, we ought to put 10% in. But God's word says much more about spending than this. In fact, I'm currently enrolled in a free course at NOBTS as I'm finishing up that very last course that I have. This one is like not graded, but it's a financial course. And I was surprised to know that more than any other topic in the Bible, Finances is one that comes up more times than most of the other topics, even sometimes more than those salvific type of themes that we would expect. And so as we look through Scripture and we see what God has to say about money and hear how we ought to use the church's resources and how they're used and who does what, I think it's important that we pay attention to these things and we model our mindset after that again of the early church. Let's read through this very short section in Acts chapter 11 as we see what God has to say about the stewardship of the church's gifts. Beginning in verse 27. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the spirit that there would be certainly a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Here in this short story, we're going to hear a lot about what's called stewardship. Stewardship is a term that is used as a good steward of God's resources throughout Scripture, but it's not a term that we often use in our context. That word steward means a manager, someone who's put in charge of something, and most of the time a steward does not own the thing that they're put in charge of. 
And so as God's people, we have to be good stewards of the resources that God has given us. That is, the resources that we have are not our own. We are but managers of them. And we're good stewards in the way that we manage our money. But more specifically for our passage at hand, we're going to find out how we can be good stewards of God's money the money that God has given us, and we have in turn given back to the Lord, the money that sits in the coffers of First Baptist Brooklyn's checking account. How do we individually and as a corporate church, how do we be good stewards of the things that God has given us? And the first thing that we see is a strange story that pops up at the end of Acts chapter 11. We wouldn't expect this story to have any bearings on finances whatsoever, but in verse 27, following the story that we just heard about of this revival that is happening in Antioch, now we hear a spiritual revival, and in verse 27 we turn to something different. Now at this time, verse 27 says, that is at the time when Saul had been called down to Antioch after Barnabas had gone there and trained up and discipled all of these people, both through evangelism and all the way unto he corporately taught and made them disciples of Jesus Christ. Verse 27, now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Good things are happening in Antioch. And they have dispatched those with the spiritual gift of prophecy to come from the mother church of Jerusalem down to Antioch. Now we can, if we stopped here and said, okay, let me prophesy of what's coming next in God's word. We could imagine some Simon Magus type stuff is about to happen. We've already heard of a type of miracle worker and a a fake one, a faux one at that in Simon Magus. And maybe that story is one we would expect. Maybe we have 1 Corinthians ideas that they're going to all start speaking in tongues or something crazy is going to happen. But the prophecies that come in out of the mouth of, we're about to find out in verse 28, the, the person Agabus has nothing to do with anything mystical, spiritual even, or supernatural. It's just a prediction. It's a prophecy of something that's going to come. Verse 28, it tells us exactly of the prophets that come, one specifically in the prophecy that comes with it. Verse 28, one of the prophets, one of them named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit. So the stood up here would indicate that here they are in a church service of some type, maybe in a a, a gathering of some type, maybe it's a, a meeting even, who knows. They're gathered in some way in which most of the people are seated. We could imagine a church service. And during this church service, to stand up would be to deliver a gift of your own to the New Testament church. And to stand up Agabus stands up and begins, verse 28 says, to indicate by the Spirit. Isn't that an interesting word? We could say Agabus preached. We could say Agabus pointed out. Agabus led along by the Holy Spirit, dictated. I mean, we could come up with a whole lot of ways to say this, but Luke says indicated. That is to point something out, to show that something is up ahead. This type of prophecy is not one that is necessarily spiritual. We would expect a prophet to stand up and say, in the year 2024, Jesus is coming back, and this is what's going to happen. That's my monster truck voice. But I mean, this is what I think is going to, that's how the prophecy we would expect to happen. It's mysterious. It's theological. It's spiritual. Not Agabus's. It's indicating. It's an interesting verb choice. Began to indicate by the Spirit, and this is what he points out that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. Now, I think the only thing about this prediction that makes it a prophecy is that adverb certainly. It's not to say it might be a famine. I can can tell that there's a possibility, as if it was a weather forecast, that there's a famine coming. But there will certainly, this is led along by the Holy Spirit, it's certain this will happen. And just as we've read multiple times in the latter chapters of Deuteronomy of how to test a real prophet from a false prophet, the only indication of a false prophecy is, did it come true or not? If the prophet's saying comes true, and it comes true over and over again, that person's a prophet. And we see at the very end of verse 28, what Agabus said certainly would happen, that a famine would happen all over the world. Verse 28, the very last sentence says, 
And this took place in the reign of Claudius. It certainly did happen. Now, where do I get money from? And how are we going to link this to money in the first place? I want to pre-read forward into verse 29. And if, since we've already read it, and now you're looking at it, in verse 29, we see the disciples are going to give. And so, to me, when I read this, and I see that this is going to be about giving, both in verse 29 and verse 30, how does that link back to the prophecy? The prophecy spurs the gift. And so the very first thing that we learn about the stewardship of God's resources is that within the church, God has placed those people who have the foresight, the forethought, the indicating spirit, hey, this is coming on the horizon. I think back to Genesis. The very last story in the book of Genesis is the story of Joseph. And Joseph's story is one of much trial, yes, but it's also a story of somebody who had some foresight, led along by a prophetic gift, specifically a gift of prophecy that manifested itself in dreams and visions. Joseph would interpret his dream and the dream of Pharaoh in order to understand that there was a coming Oh, famine. And because of this famine, he had wise counsel to give to the country of Egypt that since this famine's coming, here's what you need to do. You need to store up much more than you were expecting. That way, when the day of famine comes, you'll be all right. And so will the world around you. And so we see this gift of prophecy all the way back in in Genesis used in this type of way, a foresight, a forethought, an indicating gift. Hey, this is on the horizon. And there's these types of prophetic statements in the church today. I I am one, if you've heard me preach through 1 Corinthians, and most of you have, I'm one that I am very soft on the supernatural gifts. And prophecy sounds like a very supernatural gift, as if we're talking of something that there's no way we could possibly know anything about. But I absolutely believe that in a way much akin to this of Agabus in Acts chapter 11, that there is a gift of prophecy even in the church today. How does it manifest? It manifests in people who look around the church and say, I see our youth group growing. We might need to make some adjustments in order to accommodate for them. It comes in, hey, we've had several months that we were in the red, we were in the black. We can allot more money for these ministries or wait, we need to pare these things down and find out where we're wasting God's resources. The gift of prophecy does not always look like the supernatural thing that we might think it is. It's a gift that manifests itself even in our church today as people who look around and they look past the right now into the future of the church and they say, this is what we must do if we're going to reach our community better. This is what we must do if our ministries are going to continue to expand and that we would bless God's kingdom with our fruitful efforts more in the future. Or even in the very same way that we see now, here's calamity coming. How is the church going to respond? Maybe. Here's a disaster coming, much like a disaster like COVID was. Not that it completely killed all of our population like they said it would, or that we ran out of food like they said it would, but it certainly had many effects, wherever you might say that those effects came from. And me and Adrian were talking on the way up here, and I don't know that it was necessarily a a gift of prophecy, but at the time when COVID was happening, we couldn't even remember who gave us this lead, but we decided before COVID even started that we wanted to venture out into a way that we could give more nutritious meals to our Wednesday night kids, a thing we're still trying to do. Um, And we saw that there was lots of vans coming in with kids, that our ministry was growing, and we wanted to provide for them not only spiritually, but also physically. And at the same time that we were applying for like a grant-based program in order to do this, led along by somebody's visionary mindset that I I guessed Kenneth McArdle, but I don't know at this point who it was. COVID happened. And because of the links that we had with these people, we did not get the opportunity to give nutritious meals to our Wednesday night kids, but we did get the opportunity, if you were around during the COVID season in the First Baptist Brooklyn, to load those buses down with boxed meals and bus them to all the kids in our community. And we gave out thousands of meals during just a couple of months at the very beginning of COVID when school was out, when nobody was doing anything, when nobody was looking out for the kids. 
There was a prophetic, a visionary mindset, a, hey, we might need to look into this. And it led to this opportunity in which we were able to bless our community around us. Now, does it always happen in that kind of lucky fall in your lap type of situation? No, I think there's plenty of ways that it could happen in somebody points something out and we need to heed it. And I think that's the biggest application that I can give to you tonight is there's not many of us who look past the right now. In fact, I think it's a good thing sometimes. Jesus himself said, the birds of the air, the grass of the field, they are all taken care of. How much more do I care for you? Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough for itself. Jesus, through his brother James in the epistle of James, he says, oh, you foolish men, you say you're going to go to this city and you're going to plan for all of these things and you're going to make big money, but you don't know today. You don't know tomorrow. You don't know what's ahead. Plan for today. It has enough worry for itself, much mimicking the words of Jesus back in the Gospels. I think it's good that many of us are caught up in the right now and we can't see past it. Maybe when the good things happen in our church, maybe when ministry is happening right now, we see the right now. But there's some of us who have been blessed with a gift, call it prophecy, that's foresight, that's visionary, that's looking ahead. We need to heed those types of plannings. It's good to work in the right now. We ought to. But someone has to be looking at what's coming ahead. And God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has equipped some people in order that they might say, I'm looking at this. I'm seeing this. Here's an opportunity, but it's one we're going to have to plan for. And I would remind you of a verse or a piece of verse that we all know in the book of Proverbs. Would you flip with me to Proverbs chapter 29? Psalms, Proverbs, Proverbs 29. I want to look at a piece of a verse. You can all probably quote it to me. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. You might know it better in the King James. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Or where there is no vision, the people perish. There has to be vision in God's house, in the workings of God's kingdom, in his ministry. There has to be vision in our government, in all things. It's a proverb, not just for God's people, but for all of humanity. As there is Chinese proverbs, here is an Israeli, a Jewish proverb. Where there isn't a vision, it's not going to go great. There has to be vision. And to this, I have to say, our executive or a subcommittee of our executive committee, our constitution committee just met and rewrote our constitution. And our executive committee recommended it to the church and the church voted on the constitution amendment. And we amended a lot of things in the constitution. One of the things we did, keep in mind Proverbs 29, 18, One of the things we did in the new constitution is we took the long range planning committee and we threw them in the trash. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot of, in in a sermon on, you need a vision. That doesn't sound very visionary, brother Taylor. Let me tell you why I did it. Why we did it as a committee. Why you did it as a church. Because the long range planning committee wasn't meeting. Nobody had a vision. So you know what it was that I threw in the trash, that the committee threw in the trash, that the church threw in the trash? It was some people who had their names on a paper that were supposed to be visionaries, but none of them were vision, visionizing them. That was a word I just made up. What's my point? It is very applicable to our church because we do live in the right now. This is not a planning church. This is definitely not a long-range planning church. I can tell you that because we took it out. So where's the vision coming from? I'll mention his name again for a little while. It's coming from Kenneth McCardle. But there are other people in the church who are saying, look out, here it comes up ahead. Here's what we've got to do. This is what we need to put in place. Heed their warning. Because in the stewardship of God's resources, in the stewardship of the gift, we haven't even got to the gift yet. God has put people in place who say, this is what we ought to do. 
This is where we ought to invest. These are the avenues that we ought to go. And when we don't heed their vision, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people will perish. And likewise, can we imagine in the situation of Agabus, if Agabus had stood up in church and said, there is a great famine coming, certainly coming. And they said, sit down, Agabus, we don't have time for that right now because we're worshiping the Lord and we've got to figure out how we're going to keep these lights on. I mean, have you not looked at the financial statement? We don't have time to plan for a famine. Think of what situation they had been in. But they heeded the planning of God's people who had that spiritual gift for such a time. The Spirit led them along for this specifically. And they were able to bless in times of need. And that's where we get in verse 29. It is the responsibility of those blessed with wisdom and prophecy to have the foresight of what the church should do. But meanwhile, the role of the rest of us, the rest of the church, is to give in accordance to that vision which is cast. Agabus casts the vision of a famine is coming, and look what the rest of the church does, verse 29. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. First, I want to point out the person who's doing stuff in verse 29. It's the word that Luke says all the time, and every time I see it, I make sure that we don't have any misunderstandings. It's the word disciple or disciples here. And throughout Luke and throughout Acts, the word disciple or disciples does not mean the 12 of them. It means any who would follow after Jesus. This is the entire church, not just the 12. We're going to find the 12 in verse 30. Under a different name, albeit, but they're there in verse 30. But in verse 29, we find the disciples, that is, the church. And I want to point out also in verse 29, and look at how it begins. It doesn't even say that they like digested what Agabus had to say, but they just did it. And they didn't do it, only some of them. They all did it. In fact, of the disciples is followed by or preceded by. Any of the disciples had means. And we see what means it's talking about if we look backwards in verse 29, in the proportion that any of the disciples had means. So we might think, okay, well, only the really rich disciples would give to such a cause like this famine. No. It could be read a different way if we would read the whole thing, which is the poorest of the poor gave a proportion. That was correct. The riches of the rich gave a proportion. That was likewise correct to their financial standing. And in between and in the proportion that any of the disciples had means. Giving is not done by some. It's something that's done by all. And it's something that's done in proportion to what we have been given. Jesus says, if we are to be faithful with little, we will be faithful with much. Some of us are in a season of little. Are you faithful with it? Some of us are in a season of much. Are you faithful in it? Some of us are in a season in between. Some of us, we might not know what season we're in, but all of us are called to be faithful with what we've been given. And if the kingdom is to progress, we have to be faithful by all of us giving. And in so doing this, we each have a hand in the furtherance of God's work. Each person in the church at Antioch, because they followed through with their gift in accordance with the vision that Agabus had given and, and shown for them, now they can say, every single one of us have had a hand in giving and serving and ministering to those in Judea. We've all participated in God's work. We just had missionaries who came on this past Sunday night. Not all of us can say that we've been on a mission trip. M many of us cannot say we've been on a mission trip, but certainly even fewer of us can say we've been on a mission trip that took us internationally. Even fewer can say that we've been on a mission trip that took us to a place that's literally on the other side of the world. That's a difficult task. But you know what we can all say? We can all say we've participated in missions. How, Brother Taylor? Because each of us, if we've ever given, we give to missions. 
Our church is set up in that when you give in the offering plate, we give to organizations that are on mission. It's part of the giving. It's part of the offering is that we would give to those who are serving. Many of us have designated our gifts in such a way that we have given specifically to these individuals who we know. We've set the church up in recent years in order that we can know who these missionaries are. And though we may never go on mission, we can say, I've been on mission to Israel. How? Because I gave specifically to these who are on mission in Israel. It's the same for everything. You might not help out on Wednesday nights. But if you give, you're giving in order that these babies can come on Wednesday night because we put gas in the vans, we put food in their bellies, we turn the lights on, we run the air condition, we do all these things in order that they can come. Whatever mission, whatever ministry, whatever resource, whatever, whatever you think it is that is happening in the church, when you give, you're a part of it. And not a lesser part, you're just a part in a different way. As I've often shared the grand, my grandmother's story, what can I do in this season in the nursing home? Well, we're not all in a situation where in this season we can volunteer on a Wednesday night. We're not all in a situation where we can volunteer because of our skill set in, in a certain place. But all of us have been blessed by God and in being good stewards of what he's given us. When we give, we give in order that we can take part in the mission and the ministry that's ongoing. And when we do this, we need to be the type of church that we're reading about. When we read in Acts chapter 11, and we read in verse 29, that any of the disciples, and I said all the disciples gave, you might say, well, I just feel like you're twisting those words and you're not really being fair to the context in which it's written. I want to point you to the context of this church because we ought to be more like this early church. I want you to flip back a few pages with me to Acts chapter 2. Because the church that we're reading about is the same church that's only a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a few years from Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see the church established. And what type of church are they? I would categorize them as a radically giving church. Not a church that sometimes gives. Not a church that only gives to certain individuals or certain missions or ministries. They're radical in their giving. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. After 3,000 souls are added to the church, it tells us this. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They're spiritual people. But verse 43 continues. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those, look at verse 44, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. That does not mean they all like to join the yo-yo club and they like to yo-yo in their free time. They had all things in common. No, that's not what it means. It doesn't mean that they all like to cook. And so they went to the kitchen together because they were all real good chefs. They were all, no. They not, did not have any wants. They did not have any needs. They were common in what is mine is yours. That type of love and fellowship together. Because it tells us in verse 45 how much they had all things in common. They began selling their property, verse 45 says, and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. This is the context of the church in Acts chapter 11. The church who's giving, not just so Antioch has no need in times of famine, but so that they can give it to all of Judea, that the region all round about them might have no need in that time. And if the vision is cast, and if we know what we must do to move forward, and we withhold it, that's sin. Here, it is very clear by the prophetic word of Agabus, this is coming. And as such, the church gave to it. And in their giving, they were being obedient to the Lord. They were being obedient to the vision that was cast. They were being obedient to give. And they were doing so in a way that was right. But if we don't imagine this free gift as something that is attainable or righteous or obedient, I would point you not to the early church, but to Jesus himself. Jesus 
without any questions, without any, it has to be this way, gave as free as anyone could give. Jesus came into the world, lived a life of pure perfection, all the way to the point of the cross. And at the cross, though moments before he would search that there would be any other way in the Garden of Gethsemane, he resolved that if this must be, so be it. And he went to the cross and he freely gave his life. For what? That the Father's desires might be put first. Jesus didn't ask, well, how else can I do it? Well, can't somebody else do it? Well, can't they just be good enough? He gave freely. And it was not in his best interest. But it was according to the vision that was set before him, the desires of his father. The vision is set. He knows what he must do. He's obedient to it. Otherwise, it would be sin. But Jesus, leaning into the obedience set forth by his father, is obedient even to death even to death on the cross. This is the message of Jesus. This is the gospel, and we see that it has really practical implications to us in giving. But I fear, as I gave quite a bit of application in the vision setting aspect of this, I don't think that my takeaway at the end of this, you know, you always expect the preacher to, You might leave here and say, that was our money message. And he said, give, give, give the whole time. I don't think that's what I'm saying up here. But you would expect at this point that the application would be, therefore, you need to give. I think this is a giving church. I think you're very abundant in your giving. But here's the problem. The last part. The first part's a problem because we've already established there's not many of us who are visionary and setting a path forward. However, there's also, I think... Another issue that is more applicable, and we see that in verse 30. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul and to the elders. I don't think you have to look very far to find, unfortunately, a church scandal. A church where the secretary or the pastor or the treasurer or you fill in the blank. I'm sure you could make up something and it could be the news headline tomorrow. A church where somebody who was in charge of some money decided to do something really stupid, ungodly, unbiblical, and certainly they will answer for it one day with the funds of the church. In fact, in my um, interview process here, I was in interview processes at other churches, and I was searching that God might open up doors and show me where he would like me to serve. And here I am, how many years later, and I'm serving here. I'm happy with the decision that God has led me to, and I see why God has led me here. But one of those churches in which I was talking with, um, they had recently had an issue where a secretary had taken the church uh, debit card and had gone to Walmart and had purchased a lot of things and they just had a sneaking suspicion that money was starting to go. And so they took somehow their card or her card one, went back to Walmart, ran off the receipts and what she was purchasing with the church's money was school supplies for her children, was meals for herself. And the icing on the cake was the alcoholic beverages that she was taking home. Um, Probably not a good usage of the church's funds. Needless to say, she wasn't there anymore. And She ought not to be. And we could get a bad taste in our mouth and we could say, and that's why I don't give to the church or that's why I designate my giving. or That's why I only put it in the hand of so-and-so because I just don't trust anybody with these things. Here's who you sound like. You ready? You, You might sound like you. You sound like the people who, when they go and they see the homeless on the streets, or the beggar who's asking for whatever they need. And they say, without any context, without any knowledge, they say, well, I'm not giving to him. Because I've heard so many horror stories of people who've given to the homeless. I could tell you a bunch myself. I've had horror stories with giving to the homeless. And we could say, this person might do and list off all the bad things that they might do with the money. But guess what? Haven't we been called? to clothe those who are without clothes, to give to those who are hungry, to give to those who are without drink, to give to those who are homeless. 
Adrian's favorite Bible verse comes from the passage where Jesus himself says, when you see one, every time you've seen one of those who were, fill in the blank, and you've ministered to them, so you ministered to Jesus. But we would stand by and say, well, because of all the horror stories, this is why I don't. Now, I've already said this church is a giving church. But maybe sometimes in the way that we act, in the way that we don't plan forward, maybe we might be a little tight-fisted with God's money. And I wonder if that is the New Testament way of giving. Matthew chapter 6 seems to indicate it's not. I want to look with the time we have remaining at what does Jesus, what does the New Testament have to say about giving? Matthew chapter 6 is a chapter that in all things has changed the way I do things. Um, I've, I've preached from Matthew chapter 6 before talking about prayer and how I was convicted um, at a time when Everyone was praying before their meal at William Carey University, and I bowed my head and I closed my eyes, but I did not utter a prayer that I was being like the Pharisees, who while everybody else was doing things from their heart, I was doing things in order that I might be seen by man. And Matthew chapter 6 convicted me of this. And there's much to be said in Matthew chapter 6 about those who do something but don't do it with the right heart. Here is what Jesus says about giving. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, talks about giving. Now, it's very applicable to the poor, but I want to challenge this passage is not only about the poor, it's also about giving in the church setting. I'm going to show you how in just a minute. Matthew chapter 6, this is what Jesus says beginning in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, so that sounds like outside context, not the church. But here's how it sounds like the church. Do not sound a trumpet. We hear that and we say, oh, that's figurative language. Don't doo -doo -doo, blast your trumpet and say, look at me when you give. The trumpet here is literally referring to the, the way that it was money was given in Old, Old Testament times, in the synagogue, in the temple. When you went in and you gave your offering, there was what was called a trumpet, a literal device that you would put your money down the chute in, and it would make lots of, mo lots of noise when your money went down the chute. It trumpeted the sound of the money going down. And so if you went to the offering plate at the synagogue, at the, at the temple, you would crash your coin down in there so it sounds like, wow, he's given a whole lot of money. Even if you don't have a lot of money, that way you'd be noticed by men. And so it's a way in which you would cover these things up. And so that's where I'm challenging. This is about giving in church. So when you give to the poor, verse 2 says, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, there it is, and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret. Your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The giving that's done in the church is such that your left hand ought not know what your right hand is doing. It's something that is, when it leaves your hand, is forgotten about. Let me take us back to that word, steward. We are to be good stewards of what God has given us. And when you put your money in the plate and you are a good steward yourself, you have now transferred management. And the new steward is First Baptist Church Brooklyn or wherever you might give your money. It's Burger King, if that's where you put your money. Wherever it is, that's who's got management now. And just like the homeless on the street, here's my motto. If I give to the homeless, there's my blessing. I have been a good steward. I've been obedient to what God has called me to do. And I have watched homeless take my money, go across the street to the convenience store and prop up with a 40 and pass out on the side of the side of the building. I've seen it happen. And my motto is, I was a good steward. I was obedient with my money. He's going to have to answer for that one day. He was a bad steward of what I gave him. He was a bad steward of what God gave him. For it was by his command that I gave it to him in the first place. Likewise, for the church. Look at what it says here in verse 30. They gave, this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul. Who's Barnabas and Saul? They've just been introduced to us in Acts chapter 11. They are the ministers on the ground at Antioch. 
They're the ones who've been teaching and discipling. Barnabas was called in first. Saul was called in second. They've been the ones seeing the ministry happen. They've been doing God's work. They're the ones entrusted to take the money to who? Verse 30 continues, to the elders. Who are the elders? That word is referring to all of those who are elders. That's another word for pastors. There's three words used in Acts for pastor. Elder, overseer, and bishop, and shepherd. All three of these words refer to the task of the office of pastor. And so this word elder, these are the people who are revered, elder. They're the ones who are in charge in the churches in Judea. That's who they're giving to. And so it goes to those who are on the ground ministering in Judea. Now, I have to ask, the regular person in the church at Antioch, do they know what happened to their money? I mean, they're living in biblical times. It's not like they could pick up the phone and call First Baptist Judea and say, hey, we just sent a big sum over there. What? Y'all are installing golden toilets? They have no idea what's going on at First Baptist Judea. They don't know. They've entrusted it to their pastors, and they've entrusted it to the pastors there on the ground. Now, is this verse, am I going to use it to say, the pastor should have the say of what's done with all the money? No, absolutely not. We have things set up in such a way, though, that there are people who are in charge. That there are people who, according to the vision that's been set, say, this is where we ought to put the money. This is what we see is happening. This is what needs to be done. Have we heeded that warning? Or, let me say something very good about us. We're a very frugal church. We make sure that we cut corners and we make sure everything goes correctly and that we are good stewards of God's money and that we are hoarders sometimes of it. That's good to an extent. However, are we allowing that in everything that comes up, and the things that people are seeing coming up ahead that we're giving to those things? Going to say something? I wasn't here for it, so I'll condemn anyone who was here, or if your toes get stepped on, I'm sorry, but I'm not not good at making friends these days. Um, I'll just go ahead and make some more enemies. Um, When you look at our financial statement, and much money has been given to a certain project, specifically, a family life center for this church. And people have said for 10, 20 years, this is what's coming. This is what's ahead. This is what we ought to do. I'm not saying whether we ought to or we not ought to. I'm just asking you, church, are we listening to those who are ahead saying, this is how we plan for ministry in the future. This is how we plan for a church to continue thriving. This is how we give to those events and those things that are going to continue to minister to our church. If that is what we ought to do, if those who were visionary 20 years before, and I dare say even now, then maybe that's the direction that we ought to head. Don't listen to me. I'm not a prophet, nor am I a son of a prophet. I'll tell you that straightforward. But Let's listen to those in our church who are saying, this is where we ought to do things with them. And instead of, as a congregation, being tight-fisted with our money and saying, no, we can't spend a penny on this, we can't spend a penny on this, and over-micromanaging the things that God has given it, let's ask the people who are on the ground in our Wednesday night children's ministry, our Sunday school teachers, our youth pastor, Our pastors, all of these people who are boots on the ground doing the ministry day in and day out. I'm thankful that our church, in every instance that we've asked for Celebrate Recovery money, has said above and beyond, yes, 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 because they're not boots on the ground. They literally, confidentially, have no idea who's attending or what goes on, but they say, yes, yes, yes. That's good. Are we doing that in every area? I'm not here to condemn. I'm not here to say yay or nay. I'm here to ask you to introspectively, are you, let's go back through it, verse 27 and 28, are you heeding the warnings that people in our church are putting up ahead? This is what we must do to move forward and minister. Verse 29, are you giving? Verse 30, once it has been given, are you tight-fisted with it that you would never have your money used in such a way? 
Are you allowing that those who have been entrusted as stewards in this moment are giving with it? Ultimately, what message can I say other than this? Follow the example of Christ who freely gave, who freely gave in order that those who did not deserve it would benefit from it, who freely gave, though he would look for other avenues, trusted the Father's will most of all. There is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yes, it does apply to a passage such as this. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this time together and we thank you for your word. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to mold not only to the early church's mindset in giving, but also that of a biblical one. Lord, we pray asking that you would raise up men and women in our church who would sound the alarm of your Holy Spirit, of what is forthcoming as dangers to our church, as financial investments for our church, things that we might do in order to further your kingdom and to safeguard that which we already have. Lord, help us not only to hear those, but to listen and to plan accordingly. Lord, I pray also that you would give us a giving spirit as our church already has, so continue to bless the spirit within us that we who are faithful with little might one day be faithful with much. And Lord, we ask that when we entrust our money, whether it be to a committee, to a pastor, to a mission, to a ministry, ultimately, Lord, to you, that we would not know what our left hand and our right hand is doing, but Lord, that we would give freely and abundantly with no strings attached. Lord, we ask that you would continue to mold us and make us into your image. And we thank you for the salvation that you've given each and every one of us freely through Christ Jesus. Lord, continue to bless us as we go throughout this week. And Lord, I ask that you would just continue to place your hand upon us, guide us back together on this Sunday as we gather as your people again. We thank you and we ask all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.